Hi there and welcome to episode 86 of the Ski Podcast and thanks for joining us. In this episode we're going to be trying to be positive, we're going to look at snow reports from around the Alps but we are going to be sadly chatting about some of the latest travel rules and bans and their effect uh, but we're going to be looking ahead to Beijing as well and also inside a ski factory. I'd like to thank Switzerland Tourism for sponsoring the podcast. Uh, Switzerland, good option right now. Sad to mention, but we can't go to uh, France. But Switzerland is easier to access. Uh, you can either have a PCR test or a lateral flow test. And I think lots of people are choosing to go there at the moment instead of France or even Italy uh, and Austria as it's a bit simpler. You've got options like the Magic Pass as well, if you think it's expensive. And we'll come on to that later with Simon Burgess. Uh, I'd like to remind you, we've got 132 episodes of the Ski Podcast and 88 of those were listened to in the last week. Uh, you can listen to us on your smart speaker as well. Just try play the ski podcast and Spotify, where I think you can give us reviews now as well. And I noticed that we listen to around the world. So if you're one of the listeners in Latvia, Barbados, Iceland, or Singapore who listened to us in the last week, then thank you for joining us. Uh, my name's Ian Martin. I'd like to introduce my guest today. I'm delighted to be joined by Richard Lett from Apre Ski Bands. Hi, Richard. How are you? Hi, how are you doing? Yeah, very good. Thanks. How are you, Ian? Yeah, I'm pretty good. Pretty good. And regular guest uh, and uh, Olympian, Emily Sarsfield. Hi, Emily. How are you? Hi, Ian. How are you doing? Uh, unfortunately, our regulars, Katie Crow from Battleface Travel Insurance and uh, Al Morgan, uh, not with us this week. They're on holidays. Uh, although sadly in Al's case he was meant to be in France but uh, let's let's check uh, with our guest today when did you last ski or snowboard Rich what about yourself you are based in Meribel does that mean you're going to be making us all jealous no shockingly this is this is quite this has been quite a difficult uh, start to the season so I went uh, I've been a couple of times out the back of my house um, ski touring with the dogs and that's about it I've not made it onto the piece yet Okay, but you've been on the mountain. That puts you ahead of uh, uh, most of us. And, and your back of your house is in Meribel somewhere, is it? Yeah, Le- Lezaloo. Yeah, so it's just in the forest above Lezaloo. There's a load of load of tracks through there, load of places right. to, to go. Yeah. And where would you ski tour up to from there? There's the uh, Refuge de Trey is like a point at which you then come down the other side, if those, those that know that. Your dogs are good at going uphill. Are they good at going downhill as well? Yeah, I have to, I have to stop at you know, make sure they're not, because it has been quite deep, obviously. So, uh, and looking behind you to see how the dogs are doing <laughs> and maintaining balance in, in powder <laughs> is is a tricky one. But uh, yeah, it's, it's all Okay, good. excuse me, not a challenge I've uh, tried yet, but maybe I will uh, one day. What about you, Emily? I've got a feeling that this answer hasn't changed since you were last on the show. Oh, gosh, Ian. I mean, I'm a bit, little bit bitter there hearing that Rich is out there because obviously I tend to go to Maribel and all my family are out there in Maribel too. So he's actually sitting in the bar where I would probably be um, having a little apre drink this evening in Maribel Village. So yeah, I've not been on my skis since it's now nearly two years. Very yeah. nearly. And yeah, it's tough. I was obviously supposed to be there now, um, but I got hit like uh, many, many of us in the UK with this uh, travel ban to Okay, France. well, you know, you've mentioned, I don't know if it is the elephant in the room anymore because it was valid when we had our last podcast, but let's move on to that. France, you know, the most, I don't know whether to call it irritating or disappointing or depressing, but currently British people are not allowed to travel into France for non-essential purposes, which means uh, ski holidays. You know, personally, <laughs> I think you could put a good argument down for a ski holiday being essential. When will that ban end? You know, I've been asking all of my clients and none of them seem to have any suggestions that there's going to be anything there in the immediate future. 15th of January was mentioned to me. Rich, you're in France. You got any inside information on that? Okay, so there is one theory out there that, um, and it's it's an optimistic theory, which is why I like it. Um, And that is that the ban has mainly been to reduce the total numbers of holiday makers uh, coming over. Um, it's easier to ban the British and, the, and, and and put Russians on red lists and whatnot because they're outside of Europe and there's less ramifications uh, with, with fellow neighbouring European nations. And the Brits represent something like 30 or 40% of tourism in this region, especially the big resorts like Val d'Isère, Teen, you know, Morzine. Mary Bell, Courcheval, etc. And so Christmas, New Year, busy time of year, reduce the numbers by 30 or 40%, take pressure off the local hospitals, and then 
come the new year, there's no reason really why they can't start opening up the, the borders again. That's if you believe that theory. And that's, that's what's been spoken about a lot around here. And the announcements are uh, on the 5th of January, as we understand it. One of the interesting things about that is that you see that, that sounds like it's based on logic, whereas it does feel <laughs> that this travel ban isn't necessarily based on logic. You know, if uh, if you really wanted to eliminate Omicron or uh, COVID, then you know, in France currently uh, on today, we're speaking on the uh, 30th of December. I think France has more daily cases than in the UK. But it's just like you can't stop French people coming here to ski. So... It's easy to stop the Brits coming over, right? I don't think it is about stopping the disease. I don't think the d disease can be stopped in this in that way. It's already here, um, like you've just said. So it, it kind of reinforces that. It's not. It doesn't feel like it's a health necessarily in the in the sense that trying to stop the disease, but more just stopping reducing the numbers of people here because people here, you know, they'll break their legs and. Um, I mean, I, you know, I like I like that idea because it does suggest that there is some logic to it. And it also suggests that there could be a change once this peak season has uh, finished. So, so that is uh, encouraging. Let's just have a, a quick listen to um, something sent in by Steve Angus from uh, Val d'Isère. Uh, regular listeners will know him. He's often giving us snow reports from Val d'Isère. Uh, he's talking about the effect on the resort. So with uh, a resort like Val d'Isère, which is the uh, best part of 40, 42% dependent on the British market, uh, things are pretty uh, sad at the moment in terms of visitor numbers. Um, and this is despite lots of protocols being put in place, uh, things like mandatory mask wearing on lifts and uh, obviously now around about town due to a national uh, order. Um, so lots of protocols in place, sitting down in bars and restaurants to try and spread the uh, so I stopped the spread of COVID. Um, it is uh, unseasonably quiet here, that is for sure. Uh, the resort, uh, just before uh, France announced the new uh, national restriction of British people coming here, indeed had uh, set up much more in the way of testing centres. So as and when we, you can get over here to uh, France and to the French Alps, then uh, fear not, there'll be plenty of opportunities to stay safe and uh, get your mandatory tests that need doing happening. But despite that, with the 40% uh, downturn in visitor numbers, uh, the resort, uh, I would say, is uh, very much on its knees at the moment. Um, and of course, the knock-on effect is not just as simple as tour operators, things like that, being uh, uh, down on a number of visitors, um, whether it's ski schools or restaurants, transfer companies, um, bars, um, uh, souvenir shops are all feeling the pinch at the moment. Um, and in some ways, uh, there's quite a, a sort of undertone of people here uh, quite hopeful that uh, some sort of a national lockdown did happen because uh, at the moment there's uh, absolutely zero uh, government financial aid. Um, so um, unfortunately, things are looking pretty bleak. And of course, at the moment would be one of the peak uh, weeks of the season um, in terms of the good old uh, uh, economics uh, uh, idea of uh, supply and demand, uh, make hay while the sun's shining. This is very much a period of time when they should be uh, making hay, um, trying to uh, get ready for those lean weeks in January when things get a lot quieter again. And of course, don't forget that um, it has now uh, been the third season with uh, big effects from the effects of COVID, um, uh, which means all in all that um, we're in the situation where uh, it is looking uh, like it's going to be a very, uh, very difficult uh, season, even if things do open up um, very, very quickly. So with 20-odd uh, weeks of the season, um, and you've got to remember there are fixed costs for all these tour operators. They've still got the same uh, number of staff they have to keep on their books. They've still got the same insurance costs. Still got to um, pay for things like heating of the chalets and uh, all the rest of it. There are only minimal ways in which uh, costs can be saved. Uh, and there's even an extra cost this year. Um, which means that those uh, companies that have taken on uh, workers that are on uh, sponsored visas, then there are quite considerable overhead costs of going through the uh, visa application process. So all in all, all the tour companies have got very, very large uh, costs and the same as it, say it extends to whether we transfer companies um, and the set costs of applying for their licenses. So, uh, so much has uh, been lost and there's very little time to attempt to make it back. So, as far as resorts and um, operators, that's not necessarily tour operators, but people that operate within the resort, uh, the best we are sort of looking for now really is a, a better break-even uh, scenario because every day lost due to lack of British customers, which as I said is very, very high, 
um, is uh, effectively double um, sort of a loss in terms of uh, hitting the break even uh, mark. And uh, it, I think it will go on in the next few weeks if this continues, this lack of British customers being able to come here to the point where um, outfits decide um, whether is it worth carrying on with this season or just cutting losses and uh, shutting up shop now. And there's a definitely a growing sense that um, um, these lost few weeks are absolutely pivotal in uh, whether the resort uh, uh, and the offerings keep on going as they are. So pretty sorry state the resort is in. Uh, people that have made it out here, um, you're, wel you're, you're welcome with open arms. Fantastic for those people that have been well, have made it to the resort. And there are a few people, um, and of course you hear these anecdotal um, stories of people, you know, flying into Geneva and coming across the border into France, or or the same in Italy. Um, of course, officially not allowed to do that. And of course, if you're with family and things like that, it's a very big risk to take. But nevertheless, those that have made it out here are welcome with open arms. Um, to um, share those pounds around the resort. And all I would say to people that are able to get out here later in the season, then please do keep your bookings um, in place because uh, the money that you have sort of invested uh, towards your holiday later in the season is at the moment keeping um, the, uh, the suppliers going um, and uh, long may it continue, that is for sure. Um, but a lot of people have talked about the possibility of extended the season. They're, that They are not possibilities due to uh, everything from uh, fixed term uh, contracts for the lift companies and things like that, as well as the fact that as soon as um, spring comes around the corner, 99% of people stop thinking about skiing um, and write it off the books. So even though there might be snow until May, people are never too keen on uh, coming when it uh, gets later into the season. So all we can uh, hope is have faith that people that want to come skiing will do um, because uh, resorts like Val d'Azur really, really, really do need your uh, business and uh, your support, whether it's mental or uh, uh, pounds on the ground uh, when you can get here. So, you know, you're based in, in Mirabel, Rich. I'm interested, we're going to talk about this more, you know, down the track, but specifically, what have you noticed that it's, it's different in Mirabel over the last couple of weeks? What's the effect on local businesses? I mean, the, the local regs are that everyone has to be seated um, in bars and, and obviously restaurants are seated anyway, but in bars, um, nightclubs are shut in general. I mean, I, with, with what I do, I'm, I'm in teen and Val I mean, all the resorts, so I, 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 I sort of see how different resorts are handling it as well. Um, technically there are a couple of nightclubs that are open because they've got, you know, food licenses and they're glorified restaurants that are open to four in the morning. And in, and in some some places, there's I don't want to name any names, but some places there's full on dancing going on and full on parties, you know. And then other other resorts, there seems to be and other venues seem to be following the rules. It, it's a bit of a, a a mismatch, really, of of of, of what's happening. You know, there, there are some, like I say, there's some parties and 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 then some places people are getting told off for standing up and and coming to the bar, you know, like told off. You know. Okay. Okay. Uh, what about you know local shops and you know ski schools? Are they depressed in terms of uh, the amount of business they're doing? Every everybody, pretty much everyone's down. I would say if you own your own premises and you're a restaurant with a massive terrace, you're probably doing okay. If you're a mountain restaurant that, that you own it already, you've got a really low rent. You've probably started this season with a couple of less staff. Um, and so people I've spoken to in that category are faring OK. Um, if you're a ski shop that relied on a couple of big contracts with the UK tour operators, then you're suffering. If you're the one in the middle of town that people go to that, you know, just drop in and, and get skis from, then you're probably doing OK. OK, well, I mean, let's not focus too much on, on uh, you know, the negativity in France. It is still possible to uh, ski. If Katie was here, she'd be telling us, I'm going to do her job uh, for us, that, you know, you can go to Austria. Their rules have changed. You now need to be boosted only. You've got to be triple vaccinated. Uh, you also need to have had a PCR test within 48 hours. That rule changed uh, fairly recently. It used to be 72 hours and a number of people got caught out. I'll put a link in the show notes, but people were sent back from Innsbruck Airport 
um, earlier this week, which uh, would have been a nightmare. Some of them are actually able to stay and take some tests, but uh, a lot of inconsistency as to the details. And uh, just listener, I, if you are looking to go anywhere, just really double and triple check everything before you travel to make sure you're in the right situation. However, you can go skiing to uh, Austria. I mentioned Switzerland before. Relatively easy to get into Switzerland, a PCR or an antigen test if you're double vaccinated to go into there. And also, actually, if you've got children and and they're under 16 there's there's no other additional requirements uh, for them uh, which makes it a lot simpler in italy uh, you can ski i've got friends skiing in italy uh, this week uh, their kids are having to get you know regular vaccination uh, vaccination regular tests every uh, 48 hours the super green pass means you need to uh, show that to get on lifts and i do see that they've got new rules coming in from the 10th of january but you can ski in all of those places so there is skiing going on which is good and just to underline that i've got a few snow reports that will uh, drop in from some of our regular contributors well, listener, hopefully you already subscribe to the Ski Podcast, in which case you will have already heard the special episode that I released on New Year's Eve uh, because we had so many snow reports, so we just combined them all into one. And that is a 15-minute episode, mini episode, which you can download now. What I am going to do is I'm just going to include one of them, which is Simon Burgess, who's currently using a Magic Pass in Switzerland. Hi Ian, it's Simon here reporting from the Sass Valley in Valais, Switzerland. I've been snowboarding here over the last week as part of my Magic Pass road trip. The past week has involved riding at Sass Fay, Sass Almagau and Sass Grund, all of which have had fantastic conditions on piste. The Sass Fay Glacier is particularly enjoyable, however conditions towards the village can get icy in the afternoon. Really, all three resorts could do with a fresh dusting of snow, and as luck would have it, there is snow forecast for the coming days. In fact, just my luck, it's falling in time for me to leave and head towards Anzair. Overall, I'm enjoying the Magic Pass so far, and the offering of the resorts is excellent. I'm really looking forward to heading to Anzair, then Grimentz in the coming weeks. If you would like to learn more about the Magic Pass and the resorts covered, consider heading to my website, simonjackburgess.com, or YouTube channel of the same name, where you will find weekly videos and articles. Right, so Rich, this is your first time on the show. Now, you know, we've actually known each other for uh, for many years because you've been running bars and uh, nightclubs all over the Alps for a long time, back since when, when I was doing natives and organising parties and these different places. And when we did these parties, we'd normally have a band playing at, at one of the uh, particular events. And your business now is at Prey Ski Band. So I guess that does what it says on the tin. I wonder if you do you need to explain or can you explain what, what it is that you actually do? L- literally, it does what it says on the tin. We, we organise bands for at Prey Ski, but also for five-star hotels and in Courcheval, Val d'Isere, et cetera. So we've got that other side to us as well. And then um, and then private bookings for weddings and, and bar mitzvahs all around the world, you know. So we, we're, 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 we're a pure play. At Prey Ski Band is a pure play uh, agency, music agency, with a stock of fantastic musicians. And then we also run Peace Productions, which is like an event company to do more integrated kind of you know events and festivals and things like that so yeah okay so i mean i think probably um a lot of our listeners will have been to some of the uh, main venues that you uh, work with particularly in the kind of tarantes area but you just want to give us a, a reminder of some of the places that you're supplying music to yeah so we people will have been to the rompon here in meribel and jack's bar and uh, lodge de village and the ski lodge and places like that in the in the three valleys but we're also in the uh, the mighty sort of Coca Rico uh, venues in Val d'Isere and Teen and the Loop and the Marmotta Arms and you know it's these are all the favourite venues of British holiday makers. But then you know it's also like we're in the like I said the the hotels, so people might have a a nice drink and a and a, and a uh, in in the aperitif time, you know, in, in in a hotel like the Yule or the Aigle de Neige in Val d'Isere or the Strato in Courchevel or the Grand Zalp. The list is endless. We've got about 150 sort of clients in which we program all their music um, all season long. So how does it work with the bands then? Because I seem to recall in the past that you'd get a band out from the UK and they would be based out in the Alps all winter. Does it still work like that, that kind of model? Yeah, so we've got sort of several categories. So we have guys that now 
they had after Brexit, they had to make a choice. So a lot of guys, British guys, decided to take up full time residency. So they're here all year round, and they're part of our, you know, offering for weddings in France and Italy, etc. During the summer, we work with a lot of French bands as well, generally based in Lyon or Nice. But then we still bring them up here to stay here because you know doing the um the, the return journey for every gig is obviously quite quite a long way so that they, they'll come and do tours we still bring bands out to do uh, a season um just season only and that and that, that that's also from places like barcelona and you know italy and we've we've got quite, kind of quite a european stock of musicians and then we have uh bands that we just bring out for a two three four week tour i mean every, every tour is kind of bespoke depending on what the bands actually want to do, you know. Sure. And you mentioned uh, uh, Brexit. Uh, you know, I uh, almost dare not bring it up. But, th- you know, these days, one of the main things about Brexit uh, that uh, I guess might affect you is that there's this 90-day clause. If you're on a UK passport, you can only spend 90 days out of 180 days, which is obviously shorter than a season. Has that affected your ability to bring bands over? We've... We've managed to deal well. I mean, obviously, with them, we had to cancel everything because of COVID, but so we'll cancel a lot of bands because of COVID. We're in the middle of sorting out visas for artists that want to stay longer than 90. So I can't really tell you yet whether that's an easy process or not, because we're literally just starting it now. You can only apply for the musician's visa once you're already here with bookings. So it wasn't something we could do prior to the season. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. I mean, we've talked to people before about recruitment and how it is possible to get visas, but the process of actually going through that to make it work is pretty difficult. I think it might be easier for musicians. It's just it's a different category of worker that by nature are touring individuals. They by 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 nature, a musician doesn't just play in their in their own home. They have to go and play places. So I think that's recognized across Europe. And France has had a you know, uh, a cultural law in place since 2016, allowing non-Europeans to come and perform for for 90 days as well and actually work without a visa. And you've been, you know, organising bands coming out to the Alps for many years. Um, I don't know if anyone listening to this is is a veteran of the Natives parties, but uh, there have been bands like uh, Mullet, who we've had, uh, Bring Your Sisters. But my favourite of the past was a band called Superfly. And I remember Superfly being based out in Latania. They were staying in a property over in Latania throughout the season. They were, you know, nice bunch of lads and they used to, the brilliant cover band used to really get people on board. And we had them at a whole number of our events and they moved on to greater things. Uh, I may have told this anecdote on the uh, podcast before, but we were running one of our ski show uh, natives parties and I had John Tregell on the door and the bassist from the band, Richard had said to me, Oh, well, I've got a name for the guest list tonight. It's Sophie Ellis Bexter. And I thought this sounds highly unlikely that uh, Sophie Ellis Bexter is going to turn up on a Saturday night to an 80s party. But I gave it to uh, to John and just said, let me know if she turns up. And yes, amazingly enough, later on, she turned up. She dyed her hair at the time. So John said, I don't believe you. You don't look like Sophie Ellis Bexter to me, to which she pulled out her passport to prove it to him. And she was whisked down to the front. And then within, I think, a month or something like that, we found out they were engaged and they're now still married. So they were my favourite band. Uh, they became the feeling, uh, uh, Superfly. Do you, you recall those days, Rich? Oh, absolutely. I'm still very good friends with, particularly Rich, actually. We're in regular contact. Now, I think they're on four kids now or five kids or something ridiculous. They're um, they're. they're uh... They're doing well. We were just talking recently about a gig this summer because we we still work with them as the feeling um, for festivals and whatnot. Um, but yeah, those days were great. They they were so talented and they were so happy to entertain. So the depth of their abilities was was outstanding. Actually, they could all play each other's instruments to to the highest level. And one of my favourite things that they used to do was mid song, like just play musical chairs and swap places and. <laughs> <laughs> and without dropping the beat, without stopping the music, you know, just keep it going by like one guy would have one drumstick and the other guy would have the other and then he'd grab the other drumstick and they'd both be playing it. You know, it was just 
absolutely outstanding. Some of the they, they were I, uh, supremely uh, talented, and and Dan Gillespie Sells, who was I think the lead singer, he obviously went on to uh, to write. Um, There's something about Jamie, which has yeah. been a, a worldwide uh, success. Uh, Emily, you must have seen Superfly at some point. <laughs> Do you know what? I actually arrived. Another one you're making me really jealous about because I <laughs> arrived to Merivale the year after the feeling. So when Superfly yeah. did their last season, I came and did my first season in Merivale. So everyone was talking about this amazing band at the Ron Point. Well, actually, I have, I've watched them once at one of your gigs, actually, up at the Ron Point when you did the big festival up there and Sophia Lesbetsa was playing, the feeling, and there was so many good names. It was like... It was, it's almost perfect kind of little stadium where everyone's kind of on the slope looking down and it was a, a free gig and it was, yeah. So I have actually seen them play, but yeah. not regularly in okay. the you, like you, I would want. <laughs> so you mentioned, Emily, the uh, the romper. Uh, you know, do you have a favourite uh, venue in the Alps for live music? Oh, see, yeah, I mean, th there's a little tour, isn't there? So when I'm on, obviously on my skis and when, when I wasn't competing, now that I don't compete anymore... <laughs> Um, yeah, it would be quite nice to kind of like either start from the top, so start the folly, have a drink, then go to the wrong point and then end up um, in the Lodge de Village, which is kind of my, the local, I would say now, um, which is in Maribel Village, because I also live kind of down the mountain slightly to Maribel. So it's an easy bus ride home. <laughs> Excellent. And what about bands then? You, uh, you know, you will have seen a few saying you were slightly later than Superfly. Are there any that uh, ring out as being classic at Prey Ski Bands? Yeah, so for me, it was um, Bring Your Sisters. So they were kind of like the big band kind of throughout um, yeah, my seasons kind of over there and stuff. And a bunch of great guys. Obviously, now they've all kind of separated and gone their different ways. And, and then some, they come back together at certain points of the year. But um, yeah, they're not regularly kind of like doing their apre gigs all the time. Um, but yeah, I've seen them kind of like change and then bring in Westy, who is, you know, great apre ski guy it just they managed to just light up the room and I actually had um, a mixture of kind of like Westy the wingman and a few others at my wedding this summer um because it's just something about an apre ski band which you just don't get from a regular cover brand it's just like yeah they just bring the room alive and you know you're going to get the atmosphere cool that's great I didn't realize that did you book them through Rich <laughs> I didn't, Rich. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, they're all um, they're all either neighbours of mine or and Westy. Like, yeah, he does did quite a bit of work for me over the summer years and stuff. So, and he's actually now based here in London because he got married about a month or so after me. Okay, and Rich, you know, when this travel ban ends, because surely it will, who should people be looking out for this winter then? <laughs> Depends who we get back out. Like, you know, we there's there's some fantastic bands that were due to come out. We, we've obviously they're not allowed to come out the, the, you know they literally can't come out so we didn't really cancel them but they've, they've been cancelled but one of the bands that's a real favorite they did make it out just before the band and that's Coco and the Butterfields and they're out as a touring uh, ensemble called Voyages because the the, the, the Coco and the Butterfields project is a is an originals project it's a um, so they're they're fantastic um, you've got the Dominoes meant to be coming who are another you know, real popular band in the UK and, and they're, they're due to be coming out uh, in February and March. Again, depends if that, if that happens. Uh, and then we've got this fantastic band called The Trends and the lead singer does uh, Adele tributes around the world and gets paid fantastic money for doing those tributes. But she's just such a great singer. OK, I mean, that was really interesting. Brings back some great memories. I'm going to drop a, a couple of um, videos into the show notes if you want to see uh, Superfly at one of the natives parties. I managed to get a video of them one time. Now, Emily, great to have you uh, back on the show. We talked uh, about Olympics with Graham Bell back in September at the ski launch. I wanted to just to take this opportunity just to chat a little bit more about some of our athletes and their chances. And it's the 30th of December today. So we've got about, I think it's six weeks or something like that till the Inblix are certainly not very uh, long. So I'm going to put the pressure on you here. Who are your top three picks for medals from Team GB? So I've got to st start with Charlotte Bax from Snowboard Cross. Um, so her kind of, she's had three World Cups so far this year. She's been on the podium in two and she won qualifying in the third one, but unfortunately made a mistake in the finals. She was second over in Secret Garden in Beijing, which is obviously the Olympic track. So she, she's pretty familiar with that now. 
And um, yeah, she's she's dominating the the Snowball Cross Air World Cup at the moment. Yeah, I think you'd probably say, I mean, it's ridiculous to say in a sport like Snowball Cross, someone's nailed on for a medal because, as you said before, anything can happen at any time. But she's number one in the world at the moment. She's consistent podiums. Yeah, she's a she's a great chance for a medal. Could be a gold one. Who's who's second on your on your list? Um, so I did have Izzy Atkin or Aitken. I never know how to say the, those girls. So you've got Zoe, the younger sister, who's half pipe, and Izzy, who does a bit of half pipe and also slope style. So yeah, Izzy, um, she got a medal for us last games, um, but unfortunately she had a broken pelvis two weeks ago. So she is currently kind of a on the rehab train, but keeping hopes alive for the Olympics. Um, it's just whether you can kind of like fit that physical rehab together with that mental rehab at the same time, ready for the Olympic Games. So fingers crossed for her. Obviously, her younger sister, sister Zoe, in half pipe, she's doing amazingly well. But jumping in behind Izzy, we've got Kirsty Muir, who is one of our young guns. She was she's about 16, 17 now. Yeah, I think um, she's 17, yeah. Yeah, and she basically has, has been out there. And in the last World Cup, she came fourth. So yeah. she's knocking on the door. Yeah, I mean, I saw that. She came fourth in the slope style in the World Cup. And she also had a, a seventh at the Dew Tour, which yeah. is a, a you know a non-World Cup uh, uh, event. So, you know, she's only 17, but she's definitely a, you know, a possibility for a podium. And you mentioned uh, Zoe. I think I can't even read my writing. I think she's eighth in the world at the moment yeah. uh, on the World Cup uh, rankings. And actually, listener, if you want to hear, I did an interview with Zoe and Izzy Atkin. Uh, a little while ago I'll, I'll stick a link to that in the show notes yeah so all all three of them I think Kirsty Muir is a good one anyone else you want to yeah I mean we've got so much talent in that kind of um you know park and pipe team I mean you've obviously got Woodsy who's an old timer and you've uh you've got Gus Kenworthy who we've now got skiing for the UK but I mean I just got to want to mention Tyler Harding who is now back on the skis also again affected by injury um he actually did his ankle all the ligaments in his ankle on the tumble track back in the uk because part of the thing what they do is a lot of gymnastics to prepare themselves for the the flips and stuff like that what they put on to snow and on their skis um yes yeah, so he sustained a, a bad injury but it's great to see him back on his skis and he's going to be yeah he's going for it now he's got nothing to lose Cool. You're, you're very well uh, informed there. You sound right. Your research is even <laughs> even better than mine. Um, what about in your uh, Olympic sport? You competed uh, in the ski across. Um, Ollie Davis has had some good results. He had a very good result at the World Championships last year. What do you think his chances of, let's say, getting to the to the final, to the latter stages would be? So yeah, Ollie Davies, uh, yeah, skiing great. It's uh, it's a really tough field in snowboard cross men's because you've got some guys who'll win one week and the next week they'll be 50th. It depends on the track, it depends on the conditions and depends on the way that can ski. They've had some really tough conditions kind of in the early season because they've had a lot of wind when they were over in Val which can really affect results and stuff. All the guys are very much on a very level playing field and that's why we could see Ollie go out there and be in the medals in the finals like we saw in the world world champs or you could see ollie kind of like pushing back from like the the 32 field but he's been in kind of the qualifying stages which is exactly where he wants to be um all of the all of the competitions this year and we know he can do it um he hasn't quite been he got in top 16 and he's made those olympic qualifications so the pressure's off him he just needs to keep himself kind of like ticking away and preparing up there now um, ready for he, and he went over to Secret Garden himself, so he knows the track. He can just mentally prepare for that. They've done a little bit of wax testing and stuff, so uh, yeah, let's hope he can really get some results out there. Yeah, I mean, well, ski across and snowboard cross remain my favourite uh, events uh, to watch. You know, they're so spectacular. I love the the, the argy bargy that you get on the way down. Someone who we haven't mentioned is Katie Ormrod, who. I would say, like, if you went back maybe two years and getting podiums the whole time and, uh, you know, never nailed on for medal, but a very strong chance for medal. She's uh, on the comeback trail. I think she's kind of sitting around, uh, well, she's in the top 10 in the world rankings. She, she is um, snowboard big air. Uh, do you see any chances for her? Yeah, so um, Katie was our big hope for 2018 on the slope style and big air. Um, since then, obviously, she had that, 
terrible accident. Um, part and parcel of it, I've, I've mentioned injury so much in this last kind of five minutes, but it is part and parcel of it. And, and the guys kind of just have to physically get stronger and then mentally get back. And Katie did that. Um, she then went and got a crystal globe in big air, like what you just mentioned, just a couple of years after the Olympics. And uh, she is just gaining confidence. She's a confident snowboarder. So once she kind of can, can tick off some of those tricks, which I know she's doing in training, I know she's putting out there in, she hasn't had that many competitions prior to Christmas. She'll be kind of getting back on a snowboard and, and getting the confidence. I think she's out in Calgary right now, um, which is absolutely freezing. But uh, yeah she'll uh yeah she'll be ready yeah i saw that there's a number of competitions going on this weekend so uh, depending when i edit and publish this i might drop something else in hi there so this is ian and today's monday and i just checked in on the results from the weekend and actually it turns out that katie ormrod was competing in slope style which is not her specialist uh, area but she did get an outing in the world cup so that's great um, even more impressive though, uh, Andrew Musgrave, who I interviewed a little while ago, took a fourth place in the uh, 15 kilometres cross country, which is a brilliant, brilliant result for him. He will be very excited. And in addition to that, also over in uh, Calgary, Zoe Atkin, who we mentioned, uh, picked up a sixth place. Um, so that is really, really good for her. She's had two top tens in three days. So uh, some encouraging news for those following uh, the road to Beijing 2022. Let's just mention Dave Riding. He took a fifth in Val d'Isere. Um, Follow-up race wasn't quite as successful, but he's certainly capable of pulling out something on the uh, day. And also just a heads up for Laurie Taylor, who also skis slalom with uh, Dave Riding. I saw that he got a 25th in the World Cup, which I think is his best ever result. So he's unlikely to be winning um, a, a medal but that's still a great result and also I noticed making her debut on the World Cup circuit was Reese Bell who I've tried to interview before because I've interviewed both her father and her uncle she has uh, you know strong family connections to British racing have you ever met, met Reese or did you see her results she came 43rd uh, overall yeah so the slalom skis in the UK at the moment are uh absolutely smashing it so um we've had kind of obviously laurie and dave in the race in madonna de campilio before christmas both qualified so laurie got his first world cup points and then reese just yesterday got her first well not she didn't quite make it into the top 30 to get the points in the bag but 43rd in her first world cup i mean she's only young and then you've got charlie guest who pulls out a 14th place in the first run she didn't finish second run um, unfortunately, but I mean, that would have been definitely her kind of personal best. So, and, and, and you say that obviously Laurie's not in the, like, you know, the medal chance right now, what we'd throw him in the bucket, but in all of those Alpine sports in the Olympics, you get the kind of, it is Esther Ledecker, who was kind of the snowboard, um, GS racer, and then pulled out a gold medal in the super g as well where she came from kind of completely like left field we didn't expect it so anything can kind of really happen if they're in the mix with the best skiers in the world and kind of only 0.5 away from these guys anything can happen can can you remind me at the olympics is there a limit on the number of people from each country who take part in each discipline yeah so it's actually it's, it's quite complicated actually so it's, it's more of a global thing so for freestyle you're allowed 16 people from your country for freestyle, but obviously that's split into aerials, moguls, half pipe, big air, slope style, ski cross. So you've got only allowed 16 people across all the disciplines. So whereas normally it's four people per discipline, um, when it comes to kind of the global picture of your, of your biggest sport, it could end up being less than four people. Okay, so that might mean that in certain in certain disciplines there's a slight advantage because when I was looking through all the all the rankings I mean there's a lot of Canadians in yeah. all of the freestyle. We get rid of a load of those Canadians there's only four allowed on that start list. <laughs> okay well that's really interesting that's coming up uh, not so long now I noticed uh, a tweet from Chemi Alcott uh, saying that Ski Sunday starts again this Sunday so I think that's the 2nd of January at uh, 8 o'clock if you want to watch it live on BBC2. Okay that's brilliant Emily thanks very much for uh, that. Rich quick question for you you? will you be watching out for anything during the olympics any particular uh, sport um, you want to see uh i'm i'm really not uh, sorry to disappoint but i'm not I, I really don't follow the sport of skiing it's very much a recreational thing that i do since i retired uh, rich absolutely <laughs> absolutely 
<laughs> yeah, well, there you go. It'll, yeah, it'll, it's, it'll, it's all been yeah. downhill since uh, Ems has stopped doing it, yeah. I'm just going to drop in a, a little interview with uh, another top snowboarder. I'm not sure he was ever an Olympian, but Jamie Barrow. I talked to him at the National Snow Show at Birmingham. It seems like such a long time ago now. But there were so many people I talked to and so many interviews. I didn't have enough time to drop them all into the show. So let's find out uh, what Jamie is up to. So I'm here with uh, Jamie Barrow, multiple world record holder, I think. We, you've been on the show a bunch of times uh, before. Times so, yeah. what, what's in your agenda for, for this winter then? What's coming up? I've got quite a lot of exciting plans because obviously last year I had all these plans in place and yeah. everything just got cancelled. So it's all just been bumped up to this year. So it's concentrated the whole thing into this season. So I've definitely got a few world records I'm going to be going for. Still going for the uh, one again behind the car, being towed behind the car. Yeah. Uh, but it's more about going faster than anyone's ever Okay, been and just tell me now, what is the current record? What's the speed? So I've got it up at 183 kilometres an hour now. Being towed behind a by car Tesla, on a yeah, snowboard. Behind a car on a snowboard, yeah. yeah. So I know there's fast, I'm really happy. I'm still breaking the record, it's fine, but my target's always been over 200. Um, when I did it last year, everything that could go wrong did. Uh, I ended up having the fastest snowboard crash in history at 180 kilometres an hour. Uh, which wasn't yeah. the record I was going for, but you know what? Yeah, okay. how did you come out of that? I was knocked out, but I, I actually surprisingly walked away from it. It was an hour later I broke the record. Yeah, okay. Some so, people might say the fact you were yeah. knocked out yeah. could be linked to the fact that you want to go over to yeah, the yeah. world an it hour. Yeah, because we were only given like this one day uh, to do it. They didn't give us right, any contingency okay. day. So I was like, if I'd crashed and yeah. I didn't go and do it, I'd just spent a year in planning to do nothing. Yeah. So I basically just shook it off and were like, let's just try to do... Maybe yeah. not hit the speeds I need to, but let's just try to break the record. And obviously you've got a combination of the car, the driver, but the yeah. snowboard must be pretty important as yeah. well. I mean, most when it comes to breaking world record, especially this one, people think you just attach a rope to the back of it, the car and just go for it. There's yeah. a lot more down to it uh, than people think, and that's kind of why I'm filming this documentary at the moment. About okay. What it takes to break a world record. Right. And we go through into sort of snowboard making. So we went out to Switzerland to. Uh, meet Hansberg Kessler, which most riders probably won't know Kessler boards because it's more down the racing side of it. Yeah. But basically, this is the legend of all legends of snowboard making. Um, we went out to his factory out in Switzerland and we went and designed a board and built it all there by hand. It was amazing. Right, well. okay. Uh, and do you have a, a date at all for when you might go for a so record? We're going to be doing it again uh, end of January. Yeah. Uh, we're getting confirmed dates now we'll see the covid they're just kind of giving us dates now yeah. about when we can do it but we're going towards the end of january and location norway right again. um it's about in the middle of tesla norway. again tesla again yeah um we'll see if we can get one of their newer ones they yeah come out, but we're not sure if they'll get to europe yet in time yeah uh, the why are you talking about no the uh model s uh, but they're bringing out the new plaid version okay so like the stupid like 0 to 60 in 1.9 seconds okay like, but uh, yeah i don't well. think we'll be able to get it over uh, to europe in, yeah. in time but All right. way, any of them would work well i mean uh, that's great We're, we'll be tuning in and uh, maybe you can come back and uh, and tell us how it goes for sure, for sure. All right Thank cheers you. jamie cheers. Thank, you. Thank you uh, listener, you might have heard Jamie talk about his trip to North Korea a long, long time ago, back in episode six. He also told us about his snowboard speed record in episode 49. And, uh, well, clearly a 183 kilometres per hour wasn't fast enough for him. So uh, we'll see how he goes with that. Let's have a look at equipment. Um, Al's away this week, uh, not on holiday, but I was out in uh, Les Minuire earlier this month. And I mentioned I used Intersport uh, while I was there. Now, most Intersport uh, stores have got a boot dock uh, in the shop, and you basically use it to get the right boots for your feet. It takes a full 3D scan of your uh, foot, and it tells the boot fitter the shape of your foot, so it makes it easier for them to find the uh, right boots for you. So let's have a listen to how it works. Even for the rental boots, so we scan every customer's feet. When we scan your foot, we have all the detail, the length of your foot, the height, the type of arch as well, so this is very important. We use all the detail to find the good model for them. We, we have solution to feel very good on ski boots, the custom insole. So this you can use for skis and you can use every day in your normal shoes. When we scan your feet, we can send to you by email all the detail. So you can reuse for the next time for ski rental in everywhere in different resorts. Now, I didn't try the uh, boot dock when I was in Lehman. I had my own boots, but I'm hoping to try it on one of my later trips, assuming they go ahead uh, this winter. 
And, uh, you know, if you do do that, you can always buy the boots uh, new after you've done the fitting process and uh, you get to ski on them and try them and you can have custom insoles molded to your feet. I think it's about 30 euros. But the big advantage of doing it out there is obviously you can try them on the snow. Right. Rob Reese. Some of you might remember Charlie Reese. Well, Rob Reese, his uh, dad was out in uh, Switzerland recently. He sent us this really interesting report about how they make skis. He was out in the Stockley don't know if that pronunciation is correct. They're Stockley Ski Factory in Switzerland. This is the heart of the manufacturing process. This is where all the layers that we've seen before are going to be put together in a mold and they're going to be cooked as a cake uh, in those big oven you have there. So this is where the bombing is going to take place between the layers, which is important. They really are handmade skis. Oh, this is 100% handmade skis. You see, we have about 15 people at the moment assembling all the different layers it takes them about five five minutes to assemble all the layers on, on, on one ski the edge is a particularly surprising thing for me looks like a saw blade tell me a little bit about the edge on skis we have also different type of edges depending on the type of skis and a racing skis is not going to be cut uh, especially we want stability we i mean edges are heavy so in some skis are um, the ski touring want to the edge not to be too heavy, so it's going to be a light edges, thin, quite thin, very thin, and not too many material, but still a, a certain of um, width so that you can have the grip on the on the ice. Uh, on the opposite of the racing skis, we want uh, stiffness to be also being brought by the edges. So completely different type of edge. We have at the moment four, oh no, five different type of edges built in the skis. Okay, we see that so one of the girls here is laminating. Can you just talk us through the lamination process? Uh, so you see here we have the, the 10, 10, 15 like different... Like a jigsaw. jigsaw yeah. It's like a jigsaw. Uh, and she starts from the bottom of the ski. So she put the edge and put the ski base, put the, alum, um, the fiberglass between the edges, the aluminium. Um, then you see now she's putting the wood core, uh, always looking at the alignment. Yeah. The, that the, yeah. Here are special reinforcements for the binding area. Uh, this it's, is also it's so remarkable. It's a remark, and she's working so quickly. Amazing. How long does it take to put those? It takes about five minutes, depending First on the com ski. complexity yeah. of the of the ski, but usually five minutes. And you always clearly make them as a matched pair at this stage, or does the matching no, help no, go the, later on? Yeah. No, the matching takes place afterwards. Okay. Because, I mean, there are a lot of layers, especially the wood core, and wood is not always 100% the same. Yes, yeah, it's a so natural product, so it, we'll weigh differently. So it can happen that one ski has a bit more camera than the other one after the pressing process. And so the, we have a special team which are going to pair all the skis after the, this step. So that's real expertise. They do that by eye, by science. They do that by eye, but we also have a special measuring machine, especially for the racing skis, which gives us, um, a, I would say, more precise expertise, even though I must say that our, our guys are almost as good, even sometimes better than the machine. Absolutely. You've not made a machine that's better than the human body then and, uh, also here for the whole assembly process i mean our our workers have are so sensitive especially the women that you see now yeah yeah and you have to be precise and and uh, we cannot do this with the machine this step of the construction process so this is basically you're making an all mountain ski here the ai exactly the laser ar all mountain race one of my best my favorite skis actually <laughs> Yeah, it looks a good ski. And so it's basically put between two, two like um, slices of bread, I suppose, in the mold, is it? To be, to be baked in the oven. Exactly. So now the, the mold is going to be uh, closed and then it's going to be cooked in the oven for 25 minute, minutes at 140 degrees with very high pressure that we need for to have the good bonding of the glue. And you've got like a die here. So that's a specific die for a specific ski for a specific length. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. So we have... 30 models. Each model has um, uh, between uh, three and five lengths. So, which makes, if we say four lengths, 120 different molds actually. It's incredible the dexterity of the uh, worker here. It's absolutely fantastic. <laughs> absolutely, the speed is incredible. And what's good about a gluing system, you know, it is dry when we put the layers together. It's going to all 
uh, it's going to be um, reacted only with pressure and temperature. So this is a dry process. You see, there's not a lot of glue everywhere. It's a very clean process. So the oven basically frees the, activates the glue effectively. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. You see here some of the final step in the finishing process. So the skis were baked, were cooked. So the, the layers are glued together. But now we need to work on the side, on the side walls, on the base, on the edges, on all the small details that make the final ski. So sharpening the edge to a certain angle. Exactly, and then grinding the ski base to have perfect gliding properties. Having some special holes being built on the to put the tip protection. All all kinds of steps. Actually, the, one of the biggest part of the whole process is after the pressing process. It takes about 140 steps to build the ski. 140. So from the minute you pick up the wood and the rubber in the storehouse to the ski coming off the end of the production line, ready for sale, how long does that process take you? What was that? No. How long does the manufacturing process take? If you started with some wood in the yeah. lager house, and you've, a ski was coming off here, finished, ready? Actually, we, for the production process, we, we calculate three weeks with the whole printing of the design, pressing, finishing. If we need, for example, in racing skis, we cannot wait sometime three weeks. So we can accelerate this, and maybe in a week, we can build a, uh, a racing ski if needed. But for the normal production, we count about three weeks. And you obviously have a separate building with the racing department in. Is that where you make all the race skis and in a more accelerated time frame? No, no, no. All the racing skis are built exactly in the same uh, department than, uh, than the recreational skis. We just need to accelerate all the steps, but the building is exactly the same. The racing department have a special building that is more for the mounting of the bindings, for the special grinding, so small um, finishing process but not the whole construction of the ski. That's really where they tailor make the finish of the ski for each individual skier, so you can ship them, you know, almost ready to be waxed. Uh, you mean in the racing department? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So the whole finishing process, which is very individual, takes place in the racing department. That was really interesting, that. I don't know the pronunciation is correct. Uh, let's uh, find out. Rich, have you ever skied on Stockley skis? I think it's Stirkel because okay. it's, uh, there's an, I believe there's an umlaut over the O. Yes. Um, and I, they were my first pair of skis that I right. had an Austrian friend uh, maybe buy. I actually thought they were German, but uh, they may, maybe they're Swiss, as you, if, if, if that's what you're saying. And he got me two meter ten skis. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah. said, this, this is what you need you're a sporty guy this is what you need and that's what i had for the first four years of skiing okay and let me let oh, your first four imagine learning to ski on two meter ten uh, skis yeah. what about you uh, emily ever tried a stuckley ski yeah before? they were actually the skis what i raced um in the 2018 olympics on right okay <laughs> circle but i'm not as good I, I call it stokel i think because i'm very got an english northern accent to it to the swiss okay. and were they were they made for you <laughs> they weren't made specifically to me but they're made specifically to ski cross and okay. with ski cross you kind of have this ski which is a mix between a, a super g ski and a, G, a giant slalom ski so it's quite a specific ski because we need the speed of it because it ultimately it's top to bottom as fast as we can get but you kind of still need the 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 strength within a giant slalom ski because we still need to crank some turns so um they're one of the only ski manufacturers to make a specific ski cross style ski i think now Ilan do one as well um but kind of head and atomic they couldn't kind of dedicate as much money because it's, it's not as commercial understandably so yeah you'll see a lot of the ski cross athletes on either Ilan or stokel skis Stokel, right. Well, at least I've learned how or to say Stockley it. Or Stockley, or however you want to pronounce it. We know well, what it looks Rob, like. <laughs> Rob actually, you know, recorded some more audio, and I think some of it is specifically about race skis. So I'll see if I can track that down, and we'll put that into a future episode. 
Um, that's brilliant. OK, well, let's move to the close. We've got a few reviews. Unbounded Context on Twitter said definitely the best ski and snowboard podcast I've come across. Our friends at the Snowboard Instructor podcast said such a great podcast to listen to. Thank you, guys. Uh, ben Davis uh, sent me an email. He said, I found your podcast. I was part of the UK and snowboard industry back in the 90s. He mentions he worked for Igloo. He did seasons in St. Anton and Monterey. Uh, and your chat with Tony McWilliam reminded me of those times. Thanks for the memories and your hard work. It's great to listen to the UK perspective from here in BC, uh, in Canada. I'm still in the ski industry now, ski patrolling for the last 12 years and managing a small hotel in some of the best skiing in the world. So great to hear from you, Ben. And thanks for that. And Simon Edgington, I'd like to thank you because he bought me a, a coffee. And don't forget, you can always buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com forward slash the ski podcast. All cup as much appreciated. Uh, also enjoy all feedback about the show so please do email to the ski podcast at gmail.com but for now i would like to thank switzerland tourism for sponsoring the show and thank my guest today uh rich thank you for joining us you're very welcome thank you uh, for keeping this up it's a great great podcast mate excellent well thanks very much for that and uh emily thanks for joining us today yeah thanks ian and finally i'd like to thank you listener for sharing your time with us have a great 2022 full of open resorts and lots of snow uh, depending on the travel rules i might be in switzerland in two weeks time so your next podcast will probably be in three weeks time but until next time goodbye Hi there, listener. Ian here. This is our first podcast of 2022. I counted up in 2021. There were 37 podcasts. There's 132 of them in total. I highly recommend you listen to the back catalogue. And if you do enjoy them, feel free to buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com forward slash the ski podcast. All coffees are appreciated. I'm just going to finish off this podcast with a, a little snippet from Richard Lett, who explains why he thinks last season when the lifts were closed was the best season ever you, you asked me at the beginning before ems was there whether this is it must be better than last year but last year we closed our businesses down okay mm. and then we got financial help to pay for our standing costs to pay, pay for the fixed costs all the staff were on furlough so they you know one of your main concerns is giving people work so everybody had work the business was being covered and then we had this amazing resort to ourselves where we could just go tour it <laughs> all day long every day you do a, you do a powder run top to bottom get to the bottom and go oh should we do it tomorrow yeah of course we can do it tomorrow no one else is, is up there today so that's going to be there tomorrow again you know and we just we go back up and all the bars were doing takeaway beers and and you know burgers and chips and things like that so if you got hungry you know you had that still and you could just mm. go sit at the bus stop somewhere and I mean, that was the best season I've ever had by a long way.